this is Mike Browning, and you're listening to Sonic Perspectives. This is Michael, the Metal Angel, a.k.a. Metal Me You, and I'm speaking to the one and only Mike Browning from Nocturnus, Nocturnus AD, Early On Morbid Angel, and several other affairs. All right, so, uh, Mike, um, first thing I want to say is that uh, one of my fellow writers at the site of Sonic Perspectives wrote an amazing review of Paradox, um, and we're gonna put, it's going to be live tomorrow, so I definitely highly recommend you check it out. Um, it's, at, awesome. it's at Metal Archives right now if you want to cheat, but, uh, I mean, it's just... He, he knows him and I are on the same page. He just knows his stuff so well, and it's so eloquent and so poetic and yet so honest. But it's interesting because I was saying before, I go back to when the key first came out, and I remember when that album first came out and how shocking it was that there were keyboards in Florida Floridian death metal, and at the same time, satanic sci-fi thematic concepts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. I really have never been a huge fan of Morbid Angel, so I never really followed, you know, what happened with you and David Vincent or Trey Azagaroth or any of that stuff, because I'm still not a huge fan of that band. I really don't understand why there's such a following for him. But I'm a huge fan of Florida Death Metal, and um, especially early on Florida Death Metal. It seems like the more that I uh, watch these horror movies on Amazon Prime, I can see what really inspired Cannibal Corpse stuff. But anyway, I digress. Um, and I <laughs> obviously huge fan of nasty savage so it's sad to see that richard bateman's gone since i know he worked with you guys and oh i know that you know i mean that that floored everybody i think you know i'm it, it's it's too bad and i you know the funny thing is i just uh talked to amy uh, his wife because uh, i did a little dedication to him on the back of the, of the record um you know because he started you know nocturnus with me it nocturnus when i came up with the name the first person in the band was Richard Bateman, and it was just him and I, bass and drums. And we wrote BCAD, and I wrote the lyrics, and, and you know we had the whole song structured out, just bass and drums. And then we got Vincent Crowley, actually, from Asheron, as he was the first guitar player in Nocturnus. It wasn't um, Gino, and it wasn't, of course, Mike Davis. Um, it was actually Vince from Asheron. So, you know, a lot of people don't know that. You know, that they know he's on the first demo, but he was actually in there before Gino was on guitar. So, you know, but Richard, you know, passing away was like a really big surprise to everybody. Um, I feel, you know, like I jammed with him so many times. It just, uh, he was such a good bass player. Um, so, you know, we did a little dedication to him and I had just told Amy that, and, you know, I was like, I'll drop a CD by for you guys, you know, for an urn, uh, their son that they had Zach. So, you know, it, crazy you know the older you get just like people start like i, I last year uh in is is like i couldn't believe how many people died last year that i knew mm. you know it was like a record amount you know yeah you I'm mentioned like, wow. you, you mentioned gino marino you know yeah. also ha having passed and then of course brett hoffman from 11 creation so yeah i'm right there with you <laughs> ralph santola ralph santola yes absolutely and, uh, the funny thing about Ralph is I, I, mean, I knew him before, like, I was even a musician. Uh, his, his sister used to date somebody, um, I mean, his, his mom, sorry, used to date somebody on, 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 the, on my mom's street. Wow. So I knew him when he was like 12 or 13 years old, and I was like 14. So it's kind of before I played drums and before he played guitar. You know, so it's kind of like, yeah, I've known him for a long, long time. And, you know, then that happened, too. And it just was a, a depressing year, man, for people dying. Exactly. I hear you. <laughs> Definitely. And they're all relatively our age. And, you know, all of us born in the late 60s were just like, oh, man, what's going on here? You know, the, you know, these guys from the Rolling Stone and Mick Jagger has a heart attack and he recovers. He's back on stage and, you know, partying and stuff. And it's like all these guys from the 80s are dropping like flies. So, 
Yeah, you got. I don't know what it is, man, but you're you are right. You know, it seems like if you make it past the fifties, you're gonna make it a little bit, quite a bit longer. But if you don't make it past your fifties, <laughs> that's about it. Seems like. Absolutely, yeah, and it, it, crazy. So anyway, so um, what, what you so when you left Morbid Angel and you formed Nocturnus, what was your impetus to to go with a sci-fi kind of malevolent aspect, but also in, import keyboards because that was unprecedented. Well, I mean, uh, you know, like it didn't start that way. I, I, I still was kind of more into the occult kind of thing and, you know, being evil and things like that, you know, with, with the early Nocturna stuff. I wanted, but I did have a, like the, one of the first uh, songs that we did write besides BCAD was one called Nocturnus. And it was about this like evil city that was kind of like, it rises up kind of like an Atlantis kind of thing, you know, like, like up from hell though. It's like a, basically like a big city that would look like, you know, it, it was formed in hell, but it kind of like had the similar aspect of Atlantis, you know, and it rises up. So, uh, you know, I had that story. So that was the beginnings of kind of writing some kind of like fantasy sci-fi type stuff in with the evil, you know, like making it more than what it was. Yeah. I remember when, you know, when, expanding it, you know, a little bit. When I first bought the CD, actually, I'm pretty sure I had the cassette, um, all that Eric stuff. I'm sure I had the cassette. But when I first saw it, I looked at the track listing and I saw a song called Smash the Manger. <laughs> I was oh, just destroying like, the manger, yes. Yeah, destroying the manger. <laughs> that's it. And, no, that's right. I had I had blind illusion. It was Smash the Crystal. And then you had <laughs> Destroying the Manger. And I was just like, what the hell? That looks like a like a scanner cover or something, a sci-fi robot on the thing going into warp seven. And what's the, I, so I couldn't wait to hear it. And it was just like from that opening, it was like, this is amazing. This is like fast and thrashy and intense, you know, and obviously was listening to stuff like cynic and obviously listen to stuff like atheist and obviously listen to pestilence, but I've also listened to a lot of European stuff like corner and death row. So it was just like, what is going on, you know, in sieges, even it's like this new stuff, or even watchtower. What's, you know, this, this like the new style. It's not, thrash but it's it's intense it's fast and it's got killer drumming also you were i mean before you other than dan Beeler from exciter doing drums and vocals i don't think you know later obviously kingston Fowley, but the drumming and vocal that wasn't a common thing either right no not at all i mean and and, and it just kind of came out of necessity more than anything really we we when i was in morbid angel we tried you know, a few people, and they, they a long time ago in the beginning, we were kind of looking for somebody that could do highs like King Diamond too, because we used to do a lot of Merciful Fate covers. Really? You know, Angel Witch, Merciful Fate, yeah. And, and in the beginning, you know, we used to just jam all the time, and you know, Dallas ended up ended up singing uh, the first bass player uh, that we had, and 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 he ended up going to jail, and and when he went to jail, then Richard tried singing because him and Richard were kind of back and forth singing a little bit. At, at first it was just Dallas singing. And then, then when we got Richard, they kind of both were doing some vocals together and, um, Richard couldn't play and sing at the same time. He always had to stop playing guitar to sing. So when Dallas got put in jail, it was like, here we go again. You know, we, you know, we couldn't have Richard stopping all night playing guitar, you know, to sing. So, I, I, I just, you know, we were kind of fed up with everything going, are we ever going to find the right person for the band? And I don't know why, but I, I, in, in the funny thing you mentioned, Exciter, you know, I, I love, you know, like the Black Witch song. Right. And, and, you know, knowing that he was playing drums and singing that stuff, I, I, I that was a little bit of an influence, believe it or not, you know, for sure. And I thought, you know, I, I'm going to try this because I know what we want in the songs. I know how they go. You know, me and Trey sat down for four years and wrote all these these songs you know we had a bunch of songs not just the ones that were on abominations we had that song morbid angel that was like 10 or 12 minutes long wow that ended up being uh invocation of the continual one yeah I don't know if you know that but yeah no, that, that yeah. was a that most of the, a lot of the songs were old songs um but yeah you know so we had a bunch of stuff and material and uh, and i knew what what Trey wanted there and, and, and a lot of this stuff. And I knew what I, you know, the parts that I wrote, the more blasphemous stuff. And he probably wrote more than Necronomicon type right, stuff. Yeah, back he then. Was, yeah, definitely. And, and, and uh, yeah, he was big time into D and D. I, uh, funny thing is I never really got into the D and D thing back then. I was more into like the more evil stuff like Satanism and, you know, stuff like that back then. So, 
it, 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 it changed over time and what I get into, you know, I learn things and I kind of expand myself in, in, in different ways and, and the writing so expands itself in that manner as well, you know. And it seems so, on, on the paradox, the lyrics definitely have a very strong H.P. Lovecraft type vibe and that kind of, I don't even know what to call it, that sci-fi macabre aspect. But it also seems that on Paradox, it's like, I love Thresholds. And I remember when Thresholds came out, it was like, this is just this amazing. There's this like spaceship on the cover and they're really going sci-fi and they're really going in this different direction. But it didn't seem like obviously it was continuation of the key. It seemed like it was a new incarnation. And obviously I couldn't stand Ethereal Tomb. I was like, this is the worst Nocturnus album ever. What the hell happened? And I kind of gave up on him, which was a good idea. But um, but then now when you listen when you listen to Paradox, it's like, oh my God, this is the direct sequel to what the key was. And it almost seems like it continues that storyline and expands upon it. Um, and it, it's such an interesting concept that you have to really read between the lines and pay attention. But it's a really interesting concept that you've got going because it is so sci-fi oriented, but it's also horror oriented. But it's also, like you say, satanic, but more like the King Diamond, Merciful Fate type satanic stuff, as opposed to deicide, you know, just Glenn Benton bashing on Christ, blame it on God, I crashed my motorcycle bullshit. Um, yeah, well, we have a little bit of that, too, here and there. You know, of course, it, it's always fun to be blasphemous. Right, you know? <laughs> but to a certain extent, like Venom with one tongue and cheek type thing and still, right. you know. And that's interesting you mentioned that Dan Beeler, because you're right. I mean, other than maybe uh, the guy, another guy who died, but the Chicago band E-Trope, when I remember, you know, he played drums and sang. Oh, but that yeah, was... you know, I mean, I was familiar with that band, but I hadn't, you know, not till not that long ago did I realize that the drummer was the singer. Right. I, I liked that band, but I didn't know that much about them. Right. And and uh, and and I'd always heard stuff. I heard them on the Metal Blade, uh, Metal Massacre mm -hmm. things that they used to put out. I know they did a song on one of those. Right. And and so I, I was you know listening to some of their stuff, but um, I just never knew that their drummer sang. But I did with of course with Exciter. Right. And that always was like, man, I, I I'd like to be able to do that. You know, I, at least try it. So, you know that and and of course Autopsy. Well, yeah, um, I was going to say the next thing would be obviously, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, and so, you know, it, it was just something, it, it, it came, since I was so familiar with the songs, it was not really that hard to do for me. You know, everything was kind of, because a lot of the stuff that Trey wrote, especially, was you know, from the, ne right out of the Necronomicon, um, it, it, there were chants and stuff. So my drumming, I realized, like when we were looking for a singer in Thresholds, era time that we had a lot of people come out that couldn't catch the lyrics with the songs you know we play and they'd get lost all the time and couldn't sing right and everything and that's why we did pick the guy we did dan he was one of the only people that came right in and just nailed the songs for some reason but a lot of people were having trouble like like singing along with the songs and i came to realize that when i write i write with the drums i write with the rhythm Right. Whereas most people, when they write lyrics, they write with the melody, with the guitar. Absolutely. So the way I kind of learned to sing and play at the same time was a lot of chanting. You okay. know, like chanting, you know, these, these Necronomicon chants that Trey would write from the book, you know, and put them in the songs. And so it, I guess it kind of got more rhythmic. Right. You know, and, and from then on, I just always wrote my music, you know, more music, but lyrics you know, to the, to the music, but it's more to the rhythm than to the melody. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's almost tribal at certain times, which is what makes right, it exactly yeah. it makes it primitive. And, you know, kind of like what, you know, what Sepultura started doing and Soulfly doing and that, that, that pulled that primitive sound, which is pretty cool. But the technicality yeah. on paradox is phenomenal because you've got really high end keyboards going almost like Derek Sherinian or Jordan Rudis. But then you've got really intricate guitar going. Um, I remember when I met the guys in Vector, and I won't go on the whole Vector thing because apparently that's social media hype right now. But anyway, um, I told them, and I was just like, oh, yeah, we're really interested in Voivod. Really, and I'm like, well, you know, we're Canadian, so obviously Sacrifice. And have you ever heard Anacrusis? And they hadn't heard Anacrusis. And then I told the, the you know, main guy, I was like, we ever heard Nocturnus? He's like, no. And I'm like, you guys should hear Nocturnus because I would have th thought you were listening to Nocturnus when you wrote your album because, you know, the, the, the intricacy, but these, the kids today, yeah, I, know you're I know the band you're talking about Vector. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've heard some of their stuff. Haven't they, I think, is it, didn't they do some covers too? Oh, uh, I think I so, but not yeah, Nocturnus. I think they did a couple Nocturnus covers later. Oh, they might've later, but when I, when I met them early on, they, they were not familiar with, Anacrusis or Nocturnus, two bands that I highly compared them to that they had no clue. Um, this might've been like, seven years ago though 
Um, right. But it's yeah, interesting. This was more, more, you know, way more early, sooner than that. Okay. So I'm just saying it's like, it was just interesting because like, once again, Anna Cruz's was another band that went from this like thrash speed metal style to just like, don't even know how to describe it, but it was so unique. So how did you, with the, the musicians you have now, including a former member of uh, Obituary and also uh, Exterminated, how did you get, uh, Executioner, how did you get this lineup together? Because is it basically the AD lineup with living members uh, coalesced you know, into what is now Nocturnus AD? Yeah, mo- for the most part, yeah. I mean, everybody except for the new keyboard player we have. Um, yeah, the, w- we've been doing After Death. Well, I've been playing with the one guitar player, Damien, since like 2006. Okay. So we've done, you know, several things together and, and, and been working together for a while, writing together. And But he's he's a, he's a, a really – he likes dying fetus and stuff like that. He's really into like really heavy, choppy, you know, guitar stuff. Okay. And so he was, he was always – you know, we, we tuned down to D and the Nocturnus stuff is in E flat. So we always played when we did Nocturnus songs, we always did them in D anyway, which means they sounded a little heavier, you know, you know but they didn't sound exactly like they should, you know, but we, you know, it was just songs we were doing. So we did everything in D. We didn't want to bring like two sets of guitars and all that just to do some, you know, songs here in, in the set. But, um, so we would always just do everything in, in that one tuning it, all the after death stuff. No matter what we played, it was in D, and so if it sounded a little different, it wasn't that big of a deal because you know we were just kind of you know doing what we wanted to do with the band basically. But when I decided to do the the Nocturnus AD thing, um, you know, it was everybody that was in the band still. I, I just said, you know, I'd like to go back to the E flat tuning, you know, that Nocturnus is in, and 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 kind of continue the key story, but I don't want to do it with After Death, you know. I want I want to do it with you know, a Nocturnus thing, but I know I can't just call it Nocturnus. So, I'm, I, you know, I, I decided I'm going to do the Nocturnus AD thing, and if you guys want to do it, you know, you're welcome to. If not, you know, I'll find some different people. So everybody was definitely on board with it because we've been playing the songs for a while anyway. Okay. You know, so I felt that since we've been playing the songs for quite a while, you know, they, they, they kind of understand how they're different from what we were writing, you know, and, and what the new... Nocturnus AD songs can't be after death songs at all. Okay. They have to be completely different than what we were doing. Not just the tuning wise, but you know, thinking of, of things. And I, I, I kind of sat down and thought about, you know, like some of the big things that Nocturnus has is really quick back and forth solos, you know, odd timings that they're not generally four or eights, you know, I'll stop things at three or, or, you know, at seven, you know, things like that. And uh, we'll stop halfway through rhythm to change into a completely different rhythm. So we kind of kept that stuff in mind when we were writing the new stuff, you know, and, and these ha- has to have a lot of quick little fast solos in and out. And, you know, a lot of back and forth solos between the two guitar players. And I've always enjoyed your vocal dissonance. I mean, it's almost like a careless whisper. It's like you can understand what you're saying. That's why it's hard to categorize you guys as even death metal. Uh, maybe musically wise, but your vocals are still audible. They're not inchoate. Um, so it's that's also an interesting approach when you like have that whispering sound, you know, that's not black metal, but not death metal, but it's still audible. Um, yeah, it, puts us in, it, it does put us in a weird category. I mean, we've done festivals that were black metal festivals, right. like the Nuclear War Now. And, you know, generally a band like a death metal band wouldn't be on the Nuclear War Now fest you know they're mostly underground death uh, black metal type stuff right and and uh you know so i guess with the vocals being the way they are and it's good things and it's bad things i mean there's people that only want you know cookie monster growl you know (laughs) and i don't really do that you know i never have you know i just kind of i don't know i don't try to do anything it's just whatever kind of comes out comes out because a lot of the times i'm singing and playing you know so i can't really make too much control over it because I'm doing so many other things at the same time. And, and to tell you the truth, the less that I think about it, the better it actually is. If if, once I start thinking about what I'm doing is when I mess up. Right. Right. You mentioned nuclear war. Now, didn't they put out all your demos through Nocturnus? Yes, they did. Right. That's another reason why we ended up doing, you know, the fest because he was really interested in the demos and I had a lot of pictures, uh, you know, things that people had never seen before. So I said, well, if we're going to, you know, I said, two people put out the demos already 
you know, and there's a bunch of bootleg versions all over the place of them. <laughs> so, you know, it, I would really like to do this like one last time and, you know, because I've had at least six small labels ask me to do the demos again. And I'm like, I'm telling everybody, no, stop. This is it. <laughs> you know, I wanted to do that last nuclear war now one and make it really nice. We, we had a little booklet that went with it, if, you know, and, and had all the flyers and everything. So I did the best version I could of it, you know, with, with everything that I could find that, that I thought was unique to put in there that, you know, everybody didn't see a lot of these things. And, and so we did it and it came out really good. And I just wanted to say, this is it, you know, this is supposed to be the best version I can give you of it, you know? So, I'll have, uh, to, I'll have to track that down. That sounds awesome. Cause I've, yeah, I've, they have, you know, they have a version that has a patch, a big patch, Nocturne's patch with the original logo with the demon head. Wow. And, and yeah, it's got like a booklet that comes with it with a ton of flyers that, that are all in the booklet. You know, it's pretty neat. It's a, it's a really good package that they put together. Cause I got something from some label like 10 years ago that was your demos and it, it was pretty shoddy packaging all around. So maybe it wasn't. Well, that good. was the one that, 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 that I think, uh, Hammerheart did one. Yeah, it was Hammerheart. That's it. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, familiar. yeah, they did. They did. They did a, a like a. But that was just you know they wanted to do it, and that was what I gave them. It it's kind of got a little collage of stuff, but it wasn't really you know it was just a CD release anyway. Right. So um, you know it wasn't really what I wanted to do, but I did it back at the time just to kind of garner things that they're kind of going again, you know. Mm. And uh, that's when we were doing After Death quite a bit. So I figured I'd put that out too, you know, everybody was asking for it and asking for it. And I had pretty good copies of the demos, both of them. So, so I just got tired of hearing really crappy versions on YouTube. <laughs> I was like, at least let's put this out. So we did, you know, and then, you know, I discovered a whole bunch more stuff that I, that it, I didn't realize I had. And that's when I did the nuclear war now one with a bunch more stuff on it, you know. So it's it's definitely like the definitive version. No, I don't think anybody could put anything better than that out right now because uh, that's everything I have. And and I know the other guys really didn't have anything that they kept at all. So you know, I I had a ton of stuff from from both demo days, and you know it all went in there. So there's a bunch of really good stuff going on there. That's that's awesome. And so basically, do you still tour as Nocturnus, or is it strictly just Nocturnus AD? It's, it's Nocturnus AD. Is that because basically is a coalesce of Nocturnus and the other band AD? Because I've noticed lately there is a lot of bands using the AD. There's Carnivore AD because Pete Steele's dead and, you know, they don't want to dishonor him. There's Entombed AD because Petrov can't, Petro can't decide, you know, the, reconcile. And, you know, I when I saw Nocturnus AD originally, I thought, really? Why isn't it just Nocturnus? But then I have to profess my ignorance when it comes to most of your other bands. I've always called a Asheron Acheron, and I actually haven't heard much Asheron. Um, I haven't heard hardly any AD, and several other bands I haven't heard either. So, <laughs> yeah, it's all different though. You know, that's the cool thing about it. It does all sound different. I mean, I mean, the After Death stuff is sort of similar, but it's then again, it's you know, some of the songs are a little similar to what we're doing here, but still not. You know, and like this, they're definitely in a different lower tuning, sort of little um, chunkier sounding stuff. So we went back to the E flat here so we could get that higher, you know, really good guitar mix sound, you know, to, that makes the guitar stand out a little better. And who would, a lot of solos. Who would you say are some of your bigger drumming influences? Well, I guess because I grew up, you know, in the seventies myself, I mean, I always listened to, you know, like Bonham, you know, from Zeppelin and, and, you know, Rush, you know, Neil Peart and, and, and people like that. Absolutely. I, I, that's it. And, and then I kind of got into Tommy Aldridge quite a bit, you know, when he, when, when he was touring with Ozzy. Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, when I saw him live, I was just like, you know, he was like the first probably double bass drummer I saw live, you know, like in a big setting with Ozzy. Right. And it, it, I, I actually got to see Randy Rhodes play one time. <sighs> Um, the first time I saw Ozzy was with Randy Rose and Def Leppard was opening. Yeah, on the Diary of Madman well. tour. God, I wish I could have seen that. Yeah, so they played in Tampa and uh, I actually went to that show. So I got to see Randy Rose play one time and Tommy Aldridge was playing drums and it just blew my mind. You know, that band that Ozzy had with, with Randy Rose. And, you know, they weren't death metal by any means, but they just had a sound that nobody had. Absolutely. You know? And that that's kind of like, and, and they had a keyboard player. Mm-hmm. 
you know. And see, that's the kind of stuff that I listened to when I was growing up. I listened to some Deep Purple, you know, who had a keyboard player. Oh, yeah. I listened to, you know, you know Zeppelin, who used keyboards quite often. Uh, I listened to Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, you know, mm-hmm. Rush. And all these bands had keyboards. So when I put a band together, to me, it didn't seem that weird. I wanted to be heavy, but I wanted keyboards, you know, because everything I listened to, Rainbow, you know, I can listen to some Boston, you know, all the bands that were my favorite bands back then when I was growing up as a kid, all I seemed to use keyboards here or there or a lot, you know. So to me, they always colored the songs and made gave them an atmosphere. When I heard, you know, like, say, Cashmere from Zeppelin, if you took the keyboards out of that song, it wouldn't be half of what it is. Absolutely. If you took the effects and the keyboards away from that song, it would still be a great song, but it wouldn't be what it is. And that's funny because we began the interview talking about those we've lost. And you're also mentioning Emerson, Lake and Power Palmer. You're also mentioning Led Zeppelin. You just mentioned Deep Purple with John Lord. Once again, all these great musicians. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, so, you know, to me, having keyboards, you know, wasn't really a weird thing. You know, something that I kind of always wanted to have. It, but when I was a kid, you know, everybody played guitar or drums or bass. Nobody played keyboards. I didn't know anybody that played keyboards at all. And, and so I never had a keyboard player in any of the situations, but I always thought it'd be cool to have one. So when we came, when it came to doing the, the uh, second Nocturnus demo, I, I was like, I, you know, I used to hire, hear these people would send me their demos and they would have this really cool keyboard intro with strings or choirs and all this stuff. And then the band would come in and it's obviously like a garage recording from there, you know? And it would be like, you hear this amazing intro, then the band would come in and just be like, you know, (laughs) and it's it's like, you were expecting the band to sound like the intro, but they never did. Right, exactly. And and, and it's like, man, they write these killer intros, or they would take them from like, say, The Omen or something. Exactly. (laughs) And then uh, the band would kick in and it would sound nothing like the intro. Absolutely. And I was like, I want a band that when we do an intro, we sound like the intro when we come in i just watched a, a phantasm marathon on uh shutter with uh, joe bob briggs hosting and it was so funny because that music from phantasm is so anthemic and stuff and i was watching the final episode last night of ravager and the whole time i'm looking at a michael baldwin who's grown up as i've grown up for the last 40 some years he looks so much like getty lee <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> i just started funny. laughing i was just like When's he going to pull out his bass and start playing keyboards? But I digress. <laughs> anyway, uh, to wrap this up, we always have you pick one song from the new album uh, so that we can play it. So if fans that haven't heard it or may not be familiar with the music get a chance. If you were to pick your favorite song or a song that you would recommend most from Paradox, what would that be? Uh, I, I kind of like Aeon of the Ancient Ones. Okay. Uh, it, it's just a song that kind of goes through a lot of ups and downs and, and has a lot of you know the different textures to it as does most of the album. <laughs> yeah, they all kind of are, are on their own in different ways, but, you know, this one, it has, you know, there's 12-string guitar in there, you know, there's uh, the, a lot of the, uh, some of the sounds, like in the beginning of Aeon and the Ancient Ones, mm-hmm. um, that first sound you hear is actually not a keyboard, it's actually um, guitar synth. Oh, wow. So our uh, Belial, our other guitar player, bought one of those, uh, the new guitar, Moog guitar synth. Wow. And, uh, man, that thing sounds amazing so uh yeah it's he's been using he used it several times on the album so some of those sounds that you hear like in the beginning of seizing the throne right also that's not all keyboards that's a guitar and keyboard like guitar synth and keyboards so a new version of somewhere in time and turbo (laughs) yeah exactly yeah so we've you know we've even expanded one of the guitar players even is using synth type sounds as well that's awesome yeah he's he's really like I said, Damien's more like the, the, the very heavy guitar player, like into, you know, the, the chunky stuff and, and the shredding. And then the other guitar players, he, he loves the crazy stuff like Pink Floyd and things like that, too, right. on the side, you know. And uh, and so he likes mixing a lot of weird effects. So being there, they're two completely different guitar players, but they both love metal. That's so awesome. it, it really worked out real well because, you know, first they kind of clashed a little bit, but then when they when they understood what I was trying to get out of each one of them was what they do. You know, this, I want you to do what you do, and I want you to do what you do, but we're going to put this together and make something really strange with it. Yeah, and something unique, and something that 
just like with Possessed and their new album after a 30 year hiatus. You guys have Which been I a 20... love that new Possessed. Oh, yeah, that's, that's 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 my what favorite a great album. Job they did on that too. Favorite album of the year. And then, uh, that, yeah, which, that, which you guys have done. Amazing. So it's good that those of us who experienced that music, you know, thir- three decades ago, and then are so excited to hear what you guys are doing now, you know, and then some people who might just hear this and they have to work their way back. It works both ways. And that's what's the genius of it. Well, Mike, it's been an honor talking to you. Like I said, I was clueless what I was going to ask you, but I'm, you really elucidate a lot of things that I wasn't aware of. And I think it's very informative for the fans as well. And it's been an honor speaking to you. So, uh, like I said, check out the uh, review at Sonic Perspectives tomorrow. Awesome. Yeah, well, like I said, I'm, I'm a metalhead like everybody else. So that's kind of like the way I always look at things. I'm, I, I'm, I look at things on the same perspective that a lot of people do. You know? Perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you. Yeah, I laughed. <laughs> Sonically. But, but, you know, I mean, I look at things just like most people that listen to metal do. Because I've seen a lot of musicians have these attitudes and egos and stuff, and I just don't understand it. Exactly. Because... You know, don't you listen to this music? Aren't you a fan of it as well? You know, I can't you? I, I don't know. I just I, I get along with people on that level more than I do. I'm up here and you're down there because you're a fan and I'm a musician. Exactly. I, I don't I don't see that. I've just never looked at things that way. And I, and I like, you know, I've always looked at myself as a fan. And then when I talk to people, I kind of talk like as one too. You know. And that makes it that breaks the ice so much better because there's there's a, a sense of. Uh, camaraderie and a sense of coming together and that's the same way I always try to make my interviews conversational and you know let's just chat and talk about things and I hate asking the same question that you may have been asked ad nauseum a million times but at the same time I have to profess my ignorance at certain times when I don't know something so well you know in the early 80s it was all just metal exactly didn't have genres of metal like millions that we do now I know so everybody really did get along because if you didn't you were either metal or you were a poser. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that was it back then. You didn't have all these, anything else. You either were or you weren't. Right. And, and, that, and you know, that's what I kind of miss of the old days. And, uh, you know, I, I still think, you know, the difference between our stuff and that and, and what comes out a lot of times with the newer bands is that these are more songs, you know, like in a traditional song style with choruses and stuff. Right. And, and, you know, some people don't like that. They just like shredding all the way through and weird rhythms, and which I understand that, you know, because some of these younger bands today just can completely blow me away on the drums. But it's, you know, that's not what I play drums for. Right. You know, I, I, I'm a metalhead, you right. know, so an old style metalhead. And that's what I'll always do, you know, so and what <laughs> that's you, the way it goes. And what you and Jeff Becerra exceed in and excel in is writing lyrics that fit the music, like you say, but with no bridge or chorus. It's like there's not a repeat of anything. It's just continual, like you're reading a book, but also singing, but also keeping up with it. And that's it, genius writing because it, it ta- some people just don't have the patience to go, oh, my God, he's not. When's he going to get back to the I love you part? Or what do you know he's going to get back to the simple stuff that I can relate to? This is so complex. This is mind boggling. But at the same well, we time, have a couple choruses, like I said, we do, you know, put some traditional stuff in there to make them like songs. Right. But they're not just shred all the way through. Right. There's a lot of it, of course, but they're broken up with with parts that that like you know, are, are you know like I've even got some Zeppelin type seventy drum beats in, in on the album that people wouldn't even realize that that's what it is that's going on, you know. But you know it, that's the kind of stuff I throw in there. But the way we put it forth to the people, it kind of doesn't seem that, like it is what it is. Right. Right. Well, it's brilliant. I think it's awesome. Um, and I know that I, I wish I had a CD because I know if I played a CD and put it in the player and got out the lyric book like old school, I would absorb it a lot more than having to stream it off the damn computer. But, you know, that's how we work today and that's how things are. But like I said, definitely check out my, my comrade's review. It's He knows his stuff and it's really well written. So Nice, nice. Yeah, I've been seeing some... Uh, the reviews that people are writing have just been uh, been so descriptive. And they're, they've all been really quite different from each other. Right. And a lot of people have a their favorite song is a different one. Right. You know, like like most albums, you'll have this signature song, you know, Rain and, your Rain and Blood type of thing, you know. Sure. But it, it's like, I've heard so many people say, oh, this is my favorite song. No, this is my favorite song. And it's kind of cool that a lot of people like something different on the record, you know, which is, which is neat, you know. It shows that there is some good diversity there, or else everybody would like the same thing, you know, Absolutely. pretty much. Yeah, 
Are you guys going to do a video for any song or anything like that? Yeah, we were supposed to already have it out. It's like, um, it was supposed to have a combination of like the band with fractal stuff going on okay. and on green screens and some animation parts, uh, like in the beginning and or during some vocal parts. Well, I'm on my third animator now, <laughs> so everything else is finished except for the animation parts. Okay. And, and so uh, I, it really was supposed to come out with the album, but, uh, I've just, uh, been found out that um the first pressing of cds is completely sold out now so they're going to do a second pressing now that's awesome and yeah i know i'm like wow that's pretty cool so when the second pressing comes out is a good time to put that video out Definitely. to kind of get that another little push you know for itself so congratulations yeah, that's awesome it's, 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 a, it's a, like i said it, the video is like 80 percent finished you know i mean it, the only thing we don't really have is something for the intro at all but I mean, there's stuff for vocal parts, but I was going to fade in some more animation parts with the key character guy, Dr. Magus. Right. So, you know, I was going to do some of that in there and, it, and it's still probably going to happen. It's just not going to come out as quick as we wanted it to. So, but it, it's like I said, 80% of it's done. There's only a little bit left that we need to get the animation parts in there and everything else is put together. So it's just kind of waiting on that right now. But it should have been out already, but it will be out because... 80% of it's already finished. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I definitely look forward to seeing that too. And like I said, I'll uh, let you get on to your next interview, but it's always, it was really on it to talk to you. Great, man. Yeah, no problem. So I haven't heard a ding in yet, so it should be good. All right, so, <laughs> cool. We, we, we had plenty of time to, to, this worked out pretty good then. Awesome. Yeah, it was great. I very much enjoyed it. It was very informative and very inspiring. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right, man. Well, let me know and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get that review and I'll post it on my page. Absolutely. All right. Well, you take care, man. Have a good night. All right. You too. All right. Thanks, man. Okay. All right. Bye. All right. See ya.